In the cold darkness of the Atlantic seabed, a nuclear submarine lies broken across the abyssal plain, its hull number almost erased by time and corrosion. 9,800 feet below the surface, those numbers are still just visible, 589. USS Scorpion, the grave of 99 men who vanished without a distress call on May 22, 1968. Here is the paradox. This was not a wartime loss. No enemy torpedoes were tracked in the area, and yet something catastrophic enough to implode a nuclear attack submarine happened so fast that not one of those 99 sailors could reach the radio. What kind of disaster moves faster than a trained submariner can flip a switch? And why do some experts point to an internal explosion, while others insist the evidence suggests something entirely different? But here is the twist. For 56 years, the official record stated Scorpion's wreckage was discovered on October 28, 1968. A February 2025 article suggests the Navy may have found her in early June, just days after she went missing. Just a heads up before we continue. There is not much real imagery of USS Scorpion, so you will sometimes see representative submarines and deep sea shots that help you picture what happened. USS Scorpion was a Skyjack class nuclear attack submarine, part of the Navy's first generation of truly high speed underwater hunters. Her keel was laid down on August 20th, 1958 at Electric Boat in Groton, Connecticut. She slid down the ways on December 19, 1959, and was commissioned into service on July 29, 1960. She was 252 feet long with a beam of 31 feet. She displaced roughly 3,500 tons when submerged. What made Skipjack class boats revolutionary was not just their size, but their power. The S5W pressurized water reactor could push Scorpion past 30 knots underwater faster than most surface ships could manage in calm seas. Her armament was formidable. She had six torpedo tubes, all forward-facing, loaded with Mark 37 and Mark 14 torpedoes for conventional anti-ship and anti-submarine work. But Scorpion also carried something far more destructive, two Mark 45 Astor torpedoes, each tipped with a nuclear warhead. Her crew complement was 99 men, 12 officers and 87 enlisted, living in tight quarters designed for stealth and speed rather than comfort. Scorpion spent the better part of the 1960s prowling the Atlantic and Mediterranean, tracking Soviet submarines and surface vessels during some of the Cold War's tensest years. In February 1968, after an extended overhaul in Norfolk, Virginia, she deployed once again to the Mediterranean. Her mission was surveillance operations, monitoring Soviet naval activity in a region where both superpowers jockeyed for position. That year, 1968, and would become the deadliest year in modern submarine history. The Israeli submarine INS Dakar vanished in January. The French submarine Minerve disappeared the same month. In March, the Soviet Golf-class submarine K-129 sank in the Pacific with all hands. Scorpion would be the fourth. On May 21, 1968, Scorpion transmitted her position report while heading home, approximately 50 miles south of the Azores, steaming west toward Norfolk at standard patrol speed. Her estimated arrival date was May 27. That final transmission was routine, professional, entirely unremarkable. Nothing in the radio log suggested distress, mechanical trouble, or concern. The sea was calm, the weather fair, and Scorpion was coming home. She never arrived. May 27th came and went with no sign of Scorpion. By evening, the Navy declared her overdue and launched search operations across her projected track. On June 5th, after days of silence, the submarine and her 99 souls were officially declared presumed lost. But what makes this tragedy especially haunting is that the Navy's underwater acoustic detection network, designed to track Soviet submarines, had actually captured something. Faint sounds, recorded on May 22nd at approximately 6.59 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, were consistent with a catastrophic event somewhere in the deep Atlantic. Analysis of those recordings would fuel decades of debate. What killed USS Scorpion? The leading theory centers on her massive battery system. Every submarine relies on batteries for emergency power and submerged operations when the reactor is offline. 
Scorpion's TLX-53, a main storage battery weighed 65 tons and contained 126 individual cells. Acoustics expert Bruce Rule spent years analyzing the recorded sounds and concluded that hydrogen gas, a byproduct of battery operation, had built up and ignited in a catastrophic two-stage explosion with two blasts occurring just half a second apart. The first blast would have ruptured compartments. The second blast finished the job. At depth, the submarine would have had no chance. But there is an alternative theory that is equally chilling. In 1967 and 1968, concerns had been raised about the Mark 37 torpedo's battery, specifically a thin metal foil barrier that could break down from shipboard vibrations. If that barrier failed, the torpedo could run hot inside its tube, essentially turning into a bomb aboard the submarine itself. Some investigators believe that is exactly what happened, that a Mark 37 activated spontaneously, exploded, and triggered the catastrophic sequence that killed Scorpion. The Navy's own structural analysis group added another piece to the puzzle. Their examination of the wreckage indicated that the operations compartment collapsed at frame 33 at an estimated depth of 1,530 feet. The submarine was then broken in two by massive hydrostatic pressure as it plunged toward the bottom. Whether the collapse was caused by an explosion or by structural failure first remains the central question. In January 1969, the Court of Inquiry released its findings. The certain cause of loss could not be ascertained from available evidence. 56 years later, that conclusion has not changed. The search for Scorpion began immediately after she was declared overdue. But finding a submarine in the Atlantic is like finding a needle in an ocean-sized haystack. The Navy deployed surface vessels equipped with deep tow sonar systems, slowly dragging detection arrays across the seafloor along Scorpion's last known track. Early underwater camera systems, primitive by today's standards but cutting edge in 1968, were lowered into the Abayas, hoping to spot wreckage. The official story states that on October 28, 1968, five months after Scorpion vanished, research vessel Mazar located the wreck approximately 400 miles southwest of the Azores at a depth of 9,800 feet. Photographic passes confirm the worst. The submarine had imploded and broken apart, scattering debris across the seafloor in a pattern consistent with catastrophic structural failure. But that February 2025 article in Naval History magazine throws a wrench into the accepted timeline. Evidence now suggests the Navy may have located Scorpion's wreckage as early as June 1968, possibly within days of her loss. If true, that means the Navy knew almost immediately what condition she was in and potentially what had killed her crew, yet waited months to publicly acknowledge the discovery. The reasons for that delay, if it occurred, remain classified. Before we continue, a quick reminder. Subscribing is the easiest way to support the channel. It helps us dedicate more time to uncovering these sunken stories and preserving maritime history for everyone who loves the sea. Let's get back to the video. When investigators finally examine the wreckage in detail, several key features confirmed they had found Scorpion. Hole number 589 was visible on the sail structure, though partially obscured by marine growth and corrosion. The distinctive teardrop hull shape of the skipjack class was unmistakable even in its crushed state the operations compartment had indeed collapsed at frame 33, exactly where structural analysis predicted failure would occur. The vessel was broken into two main sections, with debris scattered between them, the distance and orientation matching the catastrophic implosion scenario. Unique fittings, welding patterns, and equipment match Scorpion's construction blueprints down to specific frame numbers. Photographic evidence was cross-referenced with archival images taken during her construction and service life. The sail had been crushed and partially separated from the hull, consistent with the immense pressures involved. And finally, official Navy confirmation classified the wreck as USS Scorpion and declared the site off-limits under naval salvage regulations. So why does this wreck still matter more than half a century later? because Scorpion represents an unresolved chapter in submarine safety and Cold War history. The nuclear reactor aboard remains intact, with no significant radioactivity detected outside the wreck during periodic Navy inspections. 
The two Mark 45 nuclear-tipped torpedoes show no signs of instability, but they are still down there, warheads and all, in international waters nearly two miles deep. In November 2012, the U.S. Submarine Veterans Organization, representing over 13,800 members, formally requested that the Navy reopen the investigation into Scorpion's loss. They argued that advances in forensic technology, acoustic analysis, and underwater imaging could finally answer questions that 1968 technology could not resolve. The Navy declined, stating that the available evidence remains insufficient to overturn the original Court of Inquiry findings. The wreck has also become an unlikely ecological site. Deep-sea researchers studying artificial habitats have noted that Scorpion, like other sunken vessels, now supports marine life in an otherwise sparse abyssal environment. More importantly, the submarine serves as a stark reminder of how quickly disaster can strike even in peacetime operations, and how much we still do not understand about the complex systems that keep submarines and their crews alive under crushing pressure. For the families of those 99 men, the debate between battery explosion, torpedo accident, and structural failure is not academic. It is personal. It is the difference between knowing what their fathers, brothers, and sons experienced in those final seconds and living with permanent uncertainty. USS Scorpion is protected under the Sunken Military Craft Act, designated as a war grave, despite being lost during peacetime operations. No salvage is permitted. No artifacts can be removed. The site exists as a memorial to the Commander Francis Slattery and the 98 men who served under him. Sailors who left Norfolk expecting to see their families again and instead became part of the ocean floor forever. The loss did drive changes across the submarine force. Battery ventilation systems were redesigned to prevent hydrogen accumulation. Torpedo safety protocols were enhanced with additional fail safes to prevent hot runs. Structural inspection standards were tightened and emergency procedures were rewritten based on lessons learned from both Scorpion and USS Thresher, lost five years earlier. But those improvements, necessary as they were, could not bring back the 99 souls entombed in twisted steel 9,800 feet down. Their sacrifice, whether caused by battery fire, torpedo malfunction, or something else entirely, reminds us that submarine service carries ultimate risk even when no enemy is present. The sea itself is an adversary enough, and at those depths, it shows no mercy and grants no second chances. USS Scorpion remains on eternal patrol, her crew still standing watch in the darkness where sunlight never reaches and the pressure is enough to crush steel-like paper.